Hello everyone. Actually, I plan to release this episode in a month, but I couldn't wait to share my latest finds from the flea market. Quite some time ago, I had the idea to replace some of my lab equipment with Soviet-made ones. No, I'm not crazy, I just love to be nostalgic. Everyone has their quirks, and I'm no exception. So, from the Soviet era, I have an excellent soldering station called Termit, a powerful adjustable AC and DC power supply with isolation from the mains, which is intended for school experiments and is simply indispensable for my experiments, as well as measuring instruments. Naturally, a classic analog multimeter, current clamps, and also a Soviet digital multimeter Electronica MMC-01. Except for the last one, all the mentioned devices were purchased at various times specifically at flea markets. Just the other day, I bought a few items to add to this lab. However, some of the purchases were made on a local online flea market, rather than offline, as I prefer. So, let's welcome the first comrade from the early 90s, something no more or less serious project can do without an oscilloscope, or affectionately, oslic. This is the C-118A, in good condition, works perfectly, and it was priced at just over 4,000 rubles. And that's a reasonable price for them, you could even say it's cheaper than average. Many of you might say it's not worth it. Perhaps but I've been looking for such an oslic for a long time, and finding oscilloscopes here is generally a problem. Specifically, the kind you wanted, simple, relatively budget-friendly, dual-channel, and in good condition, you just have to be lucky. The set includes one probe with a 1 to 1 or 1 to 10 divider with calibration capability. The device, as I mentioned, is dual-channel. The analog bandwidth is 20 MHz, which is more than enough for my pulse tasks. For the vertical sweep, its sensitivity is at least 5 millivolts per division, and at most 5 volts, but the divider on the probe will allow raising the upper limit to 50 volts per division. The lower limit is sufficient for studying power supply ripple. In general, many budget, and not only budget, modern oscilloscopes would envy such sensitivity. For the horizontal sweep, it ranges from 20 nanoseconds to 50 milliseconds. Display. Well, what kind of display is this? This is a screen, a cathode ray tube 11, ELO 9N, 6 by 8 centimeters. Filament voltage is 6.3 volts with a current from 80 to 100 milliamps. Anode voltage is 8 kilovolts. The input resistance of the oscilloscope is 1 megum. The device weighs 4 kilograms. The devices are from the Zabuvinsky factory as marital, manufactured in the year 90. They contain almost no precious metals but the refiners destroy working devices even for a much smaller amount of precious scrap. The device, although simple, is at the same time so warm and tube-like. I like its appearance, ergonomics. Everything is simple and clear, unlike the soulless digital. It's time to open the device to study its insides. Inside, everything is simple, a sweep board, an amplifier, the high voltage part, in the form of a multiplier, encased in epoxy resin, is located at the back of the case. The power transformer is small, 28 volt amperes, with connectors of decent quality. The boards are made of textilite. I expected it to be worse. In the future, I will replace all the electrolytic capacitors, clean it out, and use it. The components are consumer grade, as the oscilloscope itself is of a medium level, even, slightly below average. A laboratory power supply from 50 years ago, B5, 7. Why I needed it, I'll explain a bit later. Now let's take a look at this 11 kilogram monster, whose casing is entirely made of aluminum. It has rather modest specifications by today's standards, but quite decent for the 1970s. Output voltage up to 30 volts with a maximum current of up to 3 amperes. It has an unremarkable appearance, is inconvenient, bulky, but you could say it's eternal. There is no stabilization or current limiting function but it does have current protection. A large rotary switch is responsible for adjusting the output voltage, setting a specific value. These values can be more finely adjusted using a variable resistor. The source has a tiny analog ammeter up to 3 amps, which looks somewhat cartoonish, against the backdrop of the huge casing. Despite being a linear source, it has high efficiency. Because, 
In fact, the transformer windings are switched. But despite this, the number of transistors and the size of the heat sinks inside it are enormous. You will see this for yourself a little later. It is entirely built on germanium transistors and, attention, the output voltage ripple is only one millivolt. That's a very strong statement. And if that's the case, it can easily outperform modern lab equipment costing several hundred dollars. Here it is, the internals wonderfully terrifying. Guys, I'll repeat that the entire body is made of aluminum, and this beast weighs 11 kilograms in total. The front and face panel, the casing, everything here is aluminum. Not to mention these gigantic heat sinks. I would have thought it was some kind of class A amplifier, but definitely not a power supply. There are a couple of heat sinks here, for germanium transistors on the first one, and five on the other. In total, there are as many as six power transistors here, and these are germanium P217S. They can dissipate up to 30 watts, and the collector current is 7.5 amperes. So, you see, considering the presence of a switch and huge heat sinks, the power section would allow not just 3 amperes, but all 30 if you really wanted to, provided, of course, the transformer allowed it. Yes. I know that germanium transistors need more cooling than silicon ones, but you have to admit, this is overkill. The power transformer is quite solid, with encapsulated windings. There are a whole bunch of input capacitors, which is, of course, a huge plus. The rectifier is assembled using four powerful 10 ampere diodes of the D231 type. They are hidden under the wires. A powerful rotary switch simultaneously switches the power windings of the transformer and adjusts the output voltage by switching resistive dividers. The control board is also hidden between the heat sinks, and someone either repair this power supply or simply replace the capacitors, power cord, and bayonets here. In any case, the power supply is fully functional. The protection is simple but reliable. In case of an increase in the maximum current value, the output voltage disappears. Restarting is done by turning the power switch off and on again. The indication of power on and protection activation is done with neon lights. In general, I tested this unit at maximum current and voltage values. Not even a hint of the radiators heating up. Of course, such huge pieces of metal, even with a burner, the Chinese would probably make about 50 power supplies. From that amount of metal, there would probably be about 50 power supplies. I would check its real pulsations, but the factory ones, capacitors haven't been replaced in 50 years, and the technical specifications will clearly differ from the factory ones. So, I only checked its operation in all switch modes. In protection, no problems. The lot cost three and a half grand. I bought it for disassembly. Yes, it sounds crazy, but I need its radiators for an amplifier in the transformer. We'll integrate somewhere, considering the huge number of taps. Maybe I'll make a similar retro lab power supply, just more compact. But this was bought for one purpose, to be used in a homemade semi-automatic machine. Yes, I've already started making it, but today we're talking about something else. In general, this is a copper winding, bus bar with a cross section of 20 square millimeters in double, fiberglass insulation, and most importantly, it was bought at the price of copper scrap. Nowadays, everyone winds with aluminum wire, but only the bold use copper. Winding wire is much more expensive than scrap, so I couldn't refuse such an offer. This bundle weighs 3.3 kilograms, and it's more than enough for my purposes. The bus bar, apparently, is new. Electrolytic capacitors at 40 volts, 22,000 microfarads, a total of three pieces. Altogether cost only 800 rubles. And they were bought for another project, which, by the way, has already been completed, and a video will be released soon. These capacitors, although old, are in excellent condition. Capacitance, leakage, internal resistance, all at the level. The capacitance of all samples is greater than stated and varies with n. 26 to 30,000 microfarads. The capacitors are designed for use in high current circuits and have a screw mounting method as well as a safety valve. They are either British or French. 
In total, as I already mentioned, all of this cost 800 rubles, which is, of course, very cheap for such capacitors. By the way, their casing is not. Round, but hexagonal. I've shown everything, talked about the contest. It seems it's time to wrap up. Don't forget to rate this video, and check the description. All the details will be there. Well, that's all from me. As always, this was Kazyanov K, with you, and until next time, bye.